Okay, looks like it's time. Hello, everyone. I'm Andre Breslov, uh, and we're starting our webinar on Kotlin 1.3. Today, uh, we are co-presenting with uh, Roman Yudazarev. I'll give a short introduction now, uh, then hand over to Roman to uh, speak about coroutines, and then uh, I'll come back for a Q&A session. So uh, you probably know that we released 1.3 uh, not so long ago, and it's been a very interesting release. Many people, I'll give an overview of uh, how our core principles are realized uh, in this release and uh, what we uh, pursue with uh, what we're doing there. Kotlin is known to be a pragmatic language. Uh, this has been our motto uh, since the very beginning. And uh, here is how uh, the idea of pragmatism unfolds uh, for us. So basically what uh, a language is, how we see what a language is, uh, is a tool uh, for turning human thought into working software. And this, this is uh, the problem we are addressing. This is why we are doing Kotlin, to help people transform uh, their ideas, their thoughts, into something that's a working program. And uh, working on this, we have principles that are guiding us in general, and they are realized in 1.3. And uh, often, they, these principles are kind of misrepresented, so I want to clarify them a little bit. Uh, many people think that an important thing about Kotlin is that it's concise. Well, actually, this is not what we're looking for. Uh, what we really care about is not concision, it's not the fewest characters we can express some idea with, but readability. We want uh, the code to be clear, because we read a lot more code than we write. So it's important uh, that the code is readable, and of course, a uh, cluttered uh, code base with a lot of boilerplate, so on and so forth, is not helping readability. So some degree of concision is needed there, but our actual goal is readable code. Same goes for expressiveness. Many languages are proud um, for being expressive, and this is not a goal for Kotlin. What we actually care about is uh, how much we can reuse the code that we write in Kotlin. And there, of course, we need some uh, abstraction mechanisms that bring expressivity. But what we actually care about is uh, to enable you to take uh, some repeating concept, some pattern that uh, occurs in your code, and uh, abstract it into a library. This is why we have some degree of expressivity, and this is what we care about, code reuse. And another uh, misconception, uh, I would say, uh, about what's good about a language is originality. Like, uh, we tend to boast about uh, having invented something, and this is not a goal for Kotlin at all. So what we actually care about is quite, quite the opposite, is interoperability. So we don't want to stand out. We want to blend in as much as we can. Uh, and this is a broader sense of reuse. We want uh, to enable reuse of the existing ec ecosystems to uh, leverage all the, well, or as much of uh, existing knowledge and uh, code that is out there. And the last but not least, uh, here is soundness. Soundness is a very important property uh, of a language from a mathematical standpoint. But what we care about in Kotlin is safety and tooling. Being sound is just a, a way of implementing this. What we care about is catching your bugs as early as possible in a convenient way without cluttering your code, without uh, having you uh, struggle with the compiler. And of course, we want the tools to understand your programs as well as they can to help you refactor reliably, find usages, navigate code, so on and so forth. So this is the set of actual goals that, they, that we have. And 1.3 uh, contributes to these goals in many ways. I'll give some highlights, uh, very, very high level things. And uh, we'll give some details on particular topics later. So, but first of all, I would like to tell you about uh, where we are now and uh, what kind of momentum Kotlin has at the moment. Uh, this is the graph for our yearly usage. People who opened uh, their IDs and edited Kotlin code per year. And uh, uh, I'm really, really happy about the growth 
that we have. Uh, a couple of months ago at KotlinConf, I was uh, talking about a million and a half users uh, 2018, but now we have reached 2 million, uh, which is a very, very happy moment for me. So this is where we are. Uh, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of opportunity because uh, this community is creating great things together. And uh, of course, this is not happening in the vacuum. Uh, there is a job market uh, for Kotlin, and here is our uh, growth curve. Thanks to Dice.com for providing the data. So you can see that being a Kotlin programmer today is a very good thing. Uh, there is a growing market. You'll be in high demand. So if you're considering learning Kotlin, it's a very good idea. But uh, coming back to 1.3, this release brings a lot of things. Uh, but there is a number of things I would like to highlight. And uh, first, and probably the biggest, is what we do for scalability. Uh, you've probably heard of coroutines before, and we'll have an entire big section uh, of the webinar today. Uh, but the biggest idea behind adding a new paradigm of asynchronous programming to the language is uh, enabling scalability for the modern, modern world. Uh, we want to uh, enable people to write code uh, the way it should scale uh, for our contemporary applications. So the big news is not int introduction of the coroutines because they have been around for a while, but the graduation from the experimental status to uh, actual stable. So if you are not using coroutines yet, please go ahead and use them now. Uh, it's stable. Everybody should do this. And Roman will give you a lot more details on this topic a little later. Another thing. Very big news. We've been working on Kotlin Native uh, for quite a while now. And uh, 1.3 ships with a beta version uh, of uh, this backend. Kotlin Native enables a compilation of Kotlin programs to standalone native binaries, which means that you can uh, r uh, run without a virtual machine on multitude of platforms, iOS, Android, uh, with MDK, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, anything you like, including WebAssembly. Uh, so there is a lot of opportunity behind Kotlin Native. Uh, it's going to grow. It will develop uh, huge and interesting things there. So watch it. And we'll have a, a, a separate webinar on Kotlin Native uh, pretty soon. I'll have an announcement uh, at the end of uh, my slide deck. Another thing uh, is that Kotlin Native is hugely interoperable. We are uh, sticking to our principle of uh, sticking to our principle of interoperability on the platforms we're working on, and uh, for the JVM, it's Java interoperability. For Kotlin Native, it's C, Objective C, and Swift. So uh, you can use uh, libraries written in these languages from Kotlin Native more or less transparently, uh, which enables everything that the platforms give you uh, right there inside the Kotlin program. An important thing I would like to highlight is that Kotlin Native is not really the same as multi-platform, although many people uh, tend to mix the two. Uh, I'll try to explain very quickly what the difference is. So Kotlin Native gives you an opportunity to take a program written uh, in Kotlin specifically for platform X, say iOS or Linux, and here is your Linux targeted program written in Kotlin, you can compile it with Kotlin native, get, get a native binary and run it. But to share the same code, compile the same source uh, for different platforms, albeit different native platforms, or say Windows and JVM or JavaScript, uh, you need something more. It's not just a single compiler. You need a way to uh, abstract platform dependencies and somehow write common code that can be compiled everywhere. Uh, so this is uh, what Kotlin multi-platform is. And today you can have common code that can be run, uh, compiled for and run on the server, Android phones, uh, iOS phones, and in the browser. Through the multi-platform capabilities, there is a special built DSL for Gradle. Uh, there is an entire tool, tool chain uh, that supports this. There is the tooling in the ID. So uh, 
a lot of things can be done and reused across different platforms using Kotlin Multiplatform. There will be details about this in the second webinar as well. Um, a big part of this is multi-platform libraries because uh, just providing you a tool chain is a start, but then uh, when, when you write common code, you need to rely on something uh, being already there. And we started building an entire platform for multi-platform development, which is obviously HTTP serialization, uh, logging settings, and the uh, core routine management facilities. These are like very basic blocks. We'll be working on many more uh, interesting things there, but these are already available as multi-platform libraries. So this is more or less the highlight of what 1.3 brings to you, and I'll give you a very, very quick overview of uh, what our evolution looks like, uh, what we're looking uh, forward to in the next releases. There are three main principles that uh, drive Colin's evolution. Uh, we started as a modern language. We wanted to uh, advance uh, the standard in the mainstream languages. So we started from scratch and didn't uh, iterate on an existing language design just to get rid of the legacy. And this is something we want to preserve. We want to keep the language modern. And this is the first principle. So we'll be getting rid of legacy uh, as we accumulate it because we understand that uh, all the ideas are alive, they age, sometimes they don't age well, uh, we need to phase them out. So we'll be working on uh, getting rid of the legacy that we accumulate over time. But uh, this idea is very much constrained with the uh, second principle of comfortable updates. We can't simply say, okay, this idea is bad, we'll just throw it away and break all the existing code. But don't do this. Uh, what we do is very, very slowly, gradually prepare the world for phasing something out through deprecations, through automated migration tools, so that when we actually get rid of a legacy feature, it's not really used anywhere anymore. And the third principle is the feedback loop. So we, when we introduce something new or change something old, we want your feedback first and foremost. And this is why we have preview builds, experimental features, and uh, why we uh, design in the open and do all these things to uh, understand what you find interesting, what addresses the needs of users, uh, so on and so forth. These three principles combined give us the sense of being up to date and being relevant. This is uh, what we actually want Kotlin to be. And uh, speaking of the main priorities for next releases, we'll be doing a lot of cleanup. We've been moving very fast over the last three years. Uh, many people told us that it's time to slow down. I'm not going to say we are actually slowing down too much, but we are probably uh, shifting our focus a little bit into polishing things and, and making things smoother. Uh, uh, we'll be doing a lot of uh, technical debt collection inside the compiler and reworking the compiler to expose a real API, uh, which is a great change, and also uh, work on improving and gradating some experimental features, working on performance, uh, user experience quality, so on and so forth. Uh, here is the end of my very short introduction. I wish you to have a nice Kotlin and hand it over to Roman to tell you about core teams. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Well, let me get my content here. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Roman Yelzarov, and uh, I'm going to, ta to talk about uh, Kotlin Cartoons. Let me. So, the, the model of the Cartoons is asynchronous programming with ease.
So, what's asynchronous programming is and uh, why it's important nowadays, and why we uh, work on this for for quite a long time to bring this uh, feature to completion in 1.3. You see, uh, in the modern world, we write a lot of code that waits for something. Uh, so we write microservices, we write uh, client applications that talk with uh, server-side applications a lot, communicate a lot, and most of the time, this code simply waits. It does not it does not do any kind of uh, lots of CPU consuming work, it just waits most of the time. And for writing this kind of code, people have invented lots of different asynchronous programming techniques over time, but they all are inconvenient. And as Andrew told, we in Kotlin we strive for readability of our code. We strive uh, to make a language where uh, you can easily read the code and understand what's going on inside. So in the next session, I go through some of the ways people have uh, invented uh, to program a synchronous code, to program a code that waits for things, and we'll see how Kotlin cartoons improve upon that and make it uh, easier and more understandable. The most classic of them all, the historically oldest approach to asynchronous program is callbacks. You'll find callbacks everywhere. Like uh, take any asynchronous Java API, take JavaScript API. All of them have callbacks inside, you know. Let's see how it works. Uh, so we have a problem that requires us to wait for something. For example, we're writing a uh, social application and we need to post uh, something uh, to a server, but we have to get a request token in advance, so we need to request it to get a token. Uh, so we're writing a function that waits. Uh, but, you know, in order not to block the process, in order to allow the rest of application to work, uh, to show its UI, to process other customers, to do the other work, we don't want, we don't write it this way we do something else and for example we make it callback based and you know making a function callback based is easier we just take its return type and put it in add additional argument call it a callback and uh, instead of returning a value uh, we take uh, this value as parameter to this function and then make sure that the function itself like request token in this case returns immediately uh, but the end when the request, uh, the value is there, it invokes a callback for us. Now if we have some other function, which actually creating a post, that should also wait until the server does this thing, then we also turn it into a callback. If, if it's some parameters, we just add a callback as an extra one, and now again, result type turns into, uh, the, into the callback. So now if our search step is like post-processing, then we, uh, you know, can write our three-step procedure that uh, takes a token, creates a post, and processes it. And that would be the usual code you would write if not for asynchrony. Uh, but if we want it to be asynchronous and if we use callbacks, that simple three-step code, uh, it turns into something like this. And this is scary and not very readable even for a three-step process. Uh, and actually, it's, it has a name. The name is called a callback hell. And you can recognize it by this letter of closing braces. Uh, I mean, if you're sitting before a computer, you can actually Google callback hell right now and look at the images that Google returns. So there are lots of fun uh, you can find there in the images that are returned. Uh, and people is still writing lots of code like that. You see, it, it's, it's simple in this picture, but in fact, I've uh, simplified it for you because uh, real code has to take care of exceptions or errors that happen, especially uh, when we're talking about network communication. And that's, that's why we usually employ synchronous programming. Uh, what if a uh, request token fails? Uh, and we have to make sure we don't do the rest because we don't have a token, we have to handle it. 
what if the next step fails? Uh, we have to handle it somehow. And so this code that's actually shown here is simplified. Uh, like in reality, you would have two parameters like error and result or something more complex approach uh, to handle the errors. So in real life, this code is much scarier. And quite a long time ago, people have invented a solution. Uh, and solution goes under different names and it's called futures, promises, uh, and uh, tasks, you know, it, it, it has a lot of different names, uh, but futures and promises is uh, our two most common names for the concept. And what they figured out is this, instead of uh, taking additional parameter uh, into a function, let's uh, encapsulate the result. Let's keep our functions without additional parameter, but instead of uh, making a function wait and block execution uh, until it's done, let's quickly return a future or promise uh, of the result. And then when this future process completes or resolves, uh, then we can take the next step of computation and so on. Now we can make all our code with callbacks. Uh, and instead of additional callback parameter, we can make the code return a future. And then our code with callbacks that used to look like this, uh, with those ever uh, nested layer of calls, uh, turns into something like this. Uh, that's that's kind of a real code. Uh, it's something you would write using like Java Computable Future API with the real function names. Uh, you can see the callbacks are still there. Uh, you can recognize them uh, you know, by looking at those curly braces uh, in Kotlin. Uh, so, so what's the benefit? Uh, we gain, we still have those callbacks. The benefit is, of course, we don't have nesting indentation. When a program with futures, all our callbacks are aligned on the same line. We don't have to nest one callback into the other because instead of any parameter in callback, we return this uh, future object. And the another advantage is that with futures and promises, this is the actual code we write uh, e and it handles exceptions properly. It, uh, if operation fails, it won't do the rest of them. So it's kind of more full-fledged code. Uh, so everything is great. You know, can we just program with futures and we won't? But unfortunately, it's not that beautiful because when we program with futures, we have all those operators we have to use. Uh, and I mean, they don't actually add any value to the business logic of our code. They just, uh, this glue that links together, uh, you know, different steps in our code. And worst of all, uh, if depending on different uh, futures or promise library we use, the names of the function would be different. So for every uh, uh, futures or promise uh, type we use, we have to basically learn from scratch what are those operators. And we basically have to relearn programming because if we need a loop or we need exemption handling, then we have to find the corresponding operator. It's not like we programmed before. So it completely changes the way we program. It's, it's as if we're programming two different languages for general programming and for asynchronous programming. And that doesn't help. You know, you can't uh, to read this code to understand what's going on. And that's where coroutines come to help. So coroutines were designed uh, to uh, support asynchronous programming, uh, designed to support all the use cases people have for asynchronous programming, like network calls, like event management, uh, and all the others, but uh, do it in such a way that the code is uh, still readable and easy to understand. Uh, continuing the same example, uh, take a look at the code that used to have futures in them. Uh, the way you update it uh, for coroutine coroutines is that is this. Uh, so you keep the natural signature of a function that clearly spells the function parameters and result type, but you add a modifier to the function called suspend. This modifier basically means that this function is not going to produce result immediately. It's going to, it can actually suspend the execution for a while and then produce a result. Uh, and you do so with all the asynchrony in your code. So if you have another uh, function that goes over network and can potentially take a lot of time, 
you do the same, uh, you keep a natural signature, you add a suspend modifier. And then the beauty of it is that instead of writing with these callbacks, either with callbacks or with futures, uh, what you can do now is you can just write the code just in the way it was uh, originally, in a direct style, like line after line, what's, what's happening. And all you have to do is you have to add a suspend modifier to a function, but the rest of it works normally, like in normal code. There is uh, the difference, though, uh, like you used to uh, see uh, clearly and painfully what are the points where execution may take quite a while before. So if you're working with callbacks, that's these nesting points. If you're working with futures, you immediately saw which functions are long running because uh, like you had to program them different. They were like uh, 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 sore in your eye, but now you don't immediately see it, but that's where uh, now ID helps you because when you open this code in ID, uh, you see uh, suspension points marked in the gutter to help you. And we believe that's the right way to place them because uh, like this is secondary information to the business logic of your code. So when you read the code, the first thing you should care about is the logic is right, where you handle all the errors properly, where the flow of data is correct, and what are places where it, uh, for example, goes over network and waits for server response. This is secondary information to the logic at hand, and this should not obscure um, the code itself. And with Skyroutines, uh, you get lots of bonus features. Uh, so you can now write regular loops, uh, like you use in, in regular code. You don't have to learn a special operator to do a loop. Uh, you can do regular exception handling, like you do regular code, uh, just do try cage or whatever else. And the better way, you can use all the regular high order functions you, you love in Kotlin. You can do forage each uh, and a anything else you would use uh, in Kotlin maps, filters, all high order stuff just works. Even better, you can write your own high order functions. For example, if you want not just make a call, but you want to try it a few times and we try on errors, then you just write the corresponding high order function that does it and apply it to your code and it just works. So you do all the programming techniques, uh, all the abstractions that you would do in uh, your regular code. Now when people see this, it, it uh, seems to them like magic. Uh, but it, there's no magic, uh, and to dispel this feeling, uh, you know, of magic, uh, uh, I'll, I'll we'll take a quick uh, peek behind the scenes and see how your compiler implements this and how it works, and it helps us uh, in building intuition of what we're actually doing when we're writing this code with Kotlin currencies. So what happens is uh, that when compiler or Kotlin compiler sees this suspending function that has some signature, has some parameters or a turn type. When it actually compiles it, it actually turns into a function with this additional parameter. And if you listen carefully, you recognize that this is a callback style. You know, what an actual compiler does behind the scenes, it converts it to a synchronous function with a callback, this kind of this ages old approach to a synchronous programming. And this callback is called continuation because the actually scientific name uh, for this style of program is called continuation passing style, uh, CPS. So that's why the technical name for this callback is continuation. But if you look, continuation is just an interface declared in Kotlin standard library in uh, Kotlin Cartoons package. If you examine uh, what an interface does, it's very simple. It has a property with execution context for Cartoon and it has a callback function which you use to pass uh, the result. So continuation is just this generic callback interface in context, callback, nothing more. Uh, it's, so there's really nothing, uh, there's not much behind the Kotlin routines, but just a nice syntactic reporting program in callback. So behind the scenes, it's all your regular uh, kind of uh, programming that you would do manually uh, by carefully crafting all this callback based code, but then uh, as in the surface you can get a readable and easy to understand code. And that's what, what all the programs in uh, high level languages is basically. Instead of writing this in assembly or writing in the low languages like C, you use higher order stuff 
and let the compiler do the uh, hard work for you into transforming your nicely, uh, nice and readable code into low-level constructs. And coroutines just uh, advance this tradition. But now, uh, the challenge of all of that is that where Kotlin is primarily targeted GDM, even though we're working on multi-platform, Kotlin is uh, and uh, many of the bulk of our user base uh, and the bulk of uh, Kotlin infrastructure was all run in GDM. And in GDM world, it's, it's literally a zoo of different uh, future libraries. Unfortunately, Java itself was kind of late to the game of adding uh, primitive for synchronous programming, like completely future, the standard completely future appeared quite late uh, in Java evolution. So uh, if you go to any enterprise, there are lots of custom future library. There's uh, Google Guava package. Uh, uh, there's others uh, that uh, provide asynchronous programming facilities. And if we are to uh, benefit from uh, Kotlin curtains, we, we need a way to integrate with them. And as an example, just a pre example, let's take at this. So that's a, lab that's a popular library called Retrofit. And uh, because it's uh, designed uh, for asynchronous networking communication, it has its own future type. And its future type is a call. So you see, like, if I define a retrofit service interface for this create post function, then my return type is call. And you recognize this is future or a promise. It wraps the actual result. Uh, so how do I use it from Kotlin coroutines? In order to use it from Kotlin coroutines, I have to write a suspending function. So I, I mark my function with a pen defier, give it a natural signature. And the implementation of this function looks like this. So I take uh, this future return function and invoke uh, a wait extension function. And a wait is not a keyword in Kotlin or anything like that. It's not built in. It's just a convention. The convention is that if we have a future type, then we declare an extension function called a wait. And for all the standard features that we have lots of ready-to-use integration libraries or for the bit itself. But what if in my code base or your code base, uh, you have your own future that you've been using for the last 10 years and you now want to benefit from Kotlin coroutines, then it means you have to write your own implementation for a wait. So let's take a look how we do it. Uh, a wait is just an extension function on a call type. And how you can write a synchronous, how can I synchronously wait uh, for a result? For example, in Retrofit, you can install a callback on a call. The function is in Retrofit called in queue. Other libraries call it differently. There's, it might be called set callback, add callback, uh, uh, on completion, or something like this. A different future library has this different uh, functions to install a callback. And that's actually interesting. That's futures behind the scenes every future type behind this is running a callback. So callback is the most primitive asynchronous programming mechanism everywhere. Uh, so we can install a, a callback iteratively within Q. But the problem is that if we just do this, then this await function just returns having installed a callback. But the actual goal of this await function is to wait is uh, for the result. And this is accomplished by a special function called standard library called suspend carotene. Uh, so to actually suspend, to do this actual suspension, we invoke this suspend coroutine function. And let's examine what it does. Suspend coroutine declared uh, in standard library like this. It's a suspended function. Uh, it suspends execution of a coroutine. But inside, it takes a block of regular code with continuation. And if you study the history of programming languages, this actually a construct that has been inspired by, by a concept called call with current continuation from the language scheme, uh, which has does exactly this thing. It suspends the execution and gives a callback uh, uh, to the block you give it so that you can continue execution at any moment of time. And that's how we use it. So we do suspend routine, get this continuation. Now we install a callback, and in the callback, what call returns? we say, okay, if the call was successful, let's analyze what's happened. If it's indeed success, then we resume our coroutine with the value. If we're a failure, we resume it with exception. And that's, that's all we need 
to do the actual integration with any kind of uh, you know callback based API. So integrating uh, curtains into the existing infrastructure, into existing project that may be a legacy for, for many times is very easy. Or integrating with the existing APIs, for example, Android uh, has lots of callback based API and uh, you can use these techniques uh, to integrate with it. But I mean, we talk like here curtains and the small, like isolated pieces of code. But in order to actually work with curtains, we have to uh, start those asynchronous processes and uh, the function that do this, we call them curtain builders. So let's take a look. The example I've shown you was, had this suspending function, post type. Uh, well, what if we forget to add this modifier? What if we write just function post item and start doing uh, our stuff from inside of it? Then we immediately get an error. An error says that suspending function request token should be called only from a priority or another suspend function. So what does it mean? Uh, if you think about it, that makes a little sense. You see, request token is this specially compiled function that can suspend execution. And why it can suspend? Because behind this instance we see, it actually receives a callback. So it doesn't have to return a result immediately. It can wait and then after a while invoke a callback with this result. It's compiled in a special way to have this superpower of suspending execution. But a regular function doesn't have this superpower. You see, a regular function compiled in a regular way, it cannot, it has to return a result. It cannot suspend anything, doesn't receive a callback. It can only block, but that's not what we want. We want to be asynchronous. We don't want to be blocking threads. Uh, so, and we cannot do from a regular function. They just don't support it. it. It doesn't have any callback. It doesn't return a future. It doesn't have this capability of suspending. So that's why we can't use suspend function from a regular function. So what do we do? Uh, I mean, what do we do? We simply cannot invoke a suspend function. It's not that simple. And there is a solution. Uh, solution is a curtain builder, and the most simplest example of curtain building is called launch. Uh, it's called a launch uh, because it's used for fire and forget kind of things. Uh, you know, when we start something, launch something, uh, for its side effect. So we want to store data to database, we want to uh, update some UI. So we're not interested in the value to be used later. Uh, we're interested in the side effects that the code is going to produce, like finding, like launching a rocket. Uh, to retard it is similar. We want it to have some effect at the destination, not uh, not to return back to the base. Uh, that would be a bad idea for it to return to the base. So side effects, that's what we're interested in. And launch, uh, when we invoke a launch, uh, then uh, Carotene starts working in some background thread pool that has uh, has a default implementation. So it's 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 very similar conceptually to submitting uh, a piece of code to a uh, background executor uh, for background execution. The difference is though that we can have very complex code inside that does not actually block the execution, but it's completely asynchronous. So because it works in the background, you know all those. Uh, operations, they happen in background threads. But what if uh, I want to update my UI or do some other stuff that requires me to be in a specific thread of execution? And UI is just just a very common example. Uh, you know, you, you, everybody who programs uh, UI knows that you cannot touch UI from a random thread. You have to be sure you're on your main uh, UI thread. And Historically, that's been hard. You, you, mean, you have to carefully uh, separate this code or m make sure you, you wrap it in callbacks. With curtains, it's simple. All you have to do is specify a, a thing that we call dispatcher that controls where the code is executed. So an example, we launch in with the main dispatcher. And the main dispatcher makes sure the code is executed in the main UI thread and just setting this parameter when we launch a protein makes it execute in the main thread. Uh, well, how 
launch does its magic. You know, we saw that you can simply start it, okay, but launch, launch somehow manages to do it. Uh, you just you can just click and see how it's declared. Um, it's declared like a regular function. It's declared on a uh, thing called coroutines scope. Coroutines font is this thing where you launch coroutines in. So it declares the defaults for all the like uh, execution context and stuff. And in example, it's just a global scope, which is just default that we use unless we have something more specific. Uh, and this regular function takes a lambda, but it's a lambda that has a suspend modifier in it. So because the block of code that launch takes has this suspend modifier, that means we can use all the suspending functions from inside of it. And that's actually what makes it possible to bridge regular code with uh, the suspending code. And actually it's not completely fire forget, it actually returns a handle uh, to the thing it creates called a job. Uh, you can use it to cancel it or just check its status, things like that. You can't use it to get a result because it's launched, you're launching for side effect, but you can you can have some control. So our next topic is comparing Kotlin's approach to async await. Uh, async await has been the classical approach uh, to asynchronous programming in modern languages. Uh, and, uh, you know, as Andrew said uh, in the introduction, Kotlin doesn't strive to be original, you know, it's more about interoperability. Uh, so the, the question we often get, so why wouldn't just we did what uh, all the other uh, programming languages of the modern time, starting from C-sharp in 2010 to they introduced this pair of async await for asynchronous programming. But uh, Kotlin took a different approach for a reason. And in this section, I will explain the reason and what stands behind this decision to do it slightly different way. Uh, but first, let's compare uh, the approach. So we already saw that the Kotlin way of asynchronous programming is by doing a function with suspend modifier. Uh, let's take a look at C sharp, for example. So that's the same code written in C sharp. If you look at it from at it from several feet, it looks very similar. But if you look closer, uh, then you start to notice a difference. And you know, it's this is a C sharp code, but in fact, this is the approach that was copied to many other languages. You know, to Python, TypeScript, Dart. You know, it's coming to JS, so it's like very common approach. Uh, the, the difference, what are the difference? One is obvious syntactic differences. Uh, it's not a suspend, it's marked with a sync. It's, this is just, you know, just different keyword, but we'll see why, why, uh, why it's different in Kotlin. The other thing is that, you know, uh, uh, all the suspension points uh, in languages that use a sync await are marked with a wait keyword. Uh, so, uh, so you actually see in source code, and some people consider this good, some not, but we'll see why that's important. And that's actually an important difference, but that's not the major difference. The major difference between Kotlin approach and is actually a hidden one. It's actually uh, hidden inside the return type, because I see functions in languages that follow this approach, they return a future. And so in, in this case, in C-sharp, it's called a task. And there's an interesting tendency. Every major language, when they introduce a future, the, the, it has to invent its own name. Like, you're not considered a major language nowadays if you don't get your futures with a unique name. Uh, so, like, uh, C-sharp calls it a task, you know, Java calls it a future, um, the, uh, uh, JavaScript calls it a promise. Everybody wants, like, you know, its own unique name. Uh, so C sharp calls it a task. But well, wh wh why does it matter? Why the, why the fact that the reverse of future matters? Uh, and why we don't have a wait keyword in Kotlin? So, so let's try to understand that. And to understand that, uh, we'll, we'll see what's the, what's the problem with async and this approach. So you see in the languages with async await, on C sharp for example, uh, you can call the function like request token and it's a valid expression in C-sharp, and it, it produces the future. That's why the fact that it produces a future is important. It produces a future to, that will result in the future to the result of the call. And that's valid expression. Now, if you want uh, to wait for it, you say await request token, and that's also valid expression, and it produces a token. 
Now, what do those two ways of an ordinary function mean? The first way corresponds to concurrent behavior. Well, you invoke request token, and now you have two concurrently executing things. You have your main code, because request token returns immediately, so your rest of your code executes. Now, concurrently with it, uh, you have some background process that is requesting a token. And the second invocation with a wait for request concept token, that's the actual sequential behavior where you wait until the token is requested and then continue execution. And in languages with async await, await concurrent behavior is default. However, you know, we strongly believe that uh, concurrency is hard and concurrency is, should not be a default. You know, people always make uh, lots of mistakes uh, of various kinds when they faced with it. anything happening concurrently. So Kotlin suspending function were designed to avoid this and they were designed to imitate sequential behavior by default. So by default, everything in Kotlin happens sequentially. Uh, so that if you want concurrency in Kotlin, you have to be explicit about it. It's not coming to you by default. Uh, so in Kotlin takes a different approach to concurrency and uh, to this kind of concurrency that you make with asynchrony. And we'll take a look at it. So Kotlin approach is this. Instead of using a sync as a modifier uh, to a function uh, that returns a future. Uh, and why, what's the use case for C sharp async? The use case is, is straightforward. Uh, I'm, I might have an asynchronous function in C sharp or JavaScript that returns my future. It allows me to do two things at the same time. At the same time, I can load one image I can load another image, and now because of concurrency, because I did not write a wait, those both of the operation, they uh, execute concurrently. I have, now I can run the loading to image, and then after that, I can await for first one, I can await for another one, and I can do some post-processing, like combine the results. So the Kotlin solution to the same use case is this, instead of using Instead of using a sync as a modifier, I write a regular function, load image as sync, and I declare that it returns a future. And the Kotlin, you know, everybody has to invent their own name for a future. So, so we opened Wikipedia and looked uh, what Wikipedia says about futures and promises. And Wikipedia goes like this, futures, promises, defers, blah, 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 and it gives some other synonyms. Ah, oh, this, this is this concept. So we, oh, okay, deferred. This isn't even what we used yet, so we'll use it. So we've used uh, the, the deferred as our name for our future, but then we have uh, just a carotene builder that we name a sync, and we name a sync as simple as a tribute to the way it's done uh, in uh, C-sharp JavaScript and other languages. So there you write on the left as a modifier to, to say that your function is going to return a future. And in Kotlin, we write it to the right. Uh, a carotene builder that is returning a future. And now having written function this way, we can start two operations concurrently. Uh, we can wait their results, but a wait for Kotlin is not a keyword, it's just a convention. We just invoke a wait on those futures and it suspends the execution until the results complete and we can post-process it. But here is a problem. And that is actually problem plex. Uh, many, many uh, pieces of real life code that tries to work with futures. I mean, there are ways to avoid it, but that's, you have to be careful when you're working with futures. Because think about it. What happens if, while you're waiting for the first image loading to complete, it, it actually crashes. So it fails to load the first image and throws an exception. In this case, you know, the whole process of words, but you're still loading the second image. So basically you just leaked a background process that's still running the program because it's there's you see we're doing concurrent things here. Like we started two concurrent operations, one of them crashed, but it still works concurrently with the rest of the code. Now if I retry this whole process, retry it again, and say there is a permanent problem with the first image, it crashes again. But again, uh, the attempt to load the second image will still work in the program. And this way I can quickly run out of resources. And unfortunately, uh, that's that's not an imagined problem, that's 
the problem that plagues many <laughs> real time, uh, real life uh, pieces of software and makes uh, you know asynchronous programming uh, so fraught with uh, hard to track mistakes. So that's one of the reasons uh, we don't recommend using futures in, in your code in Kotlin. And we uh, design it so you don't have to use futures. So uh, the way we recommend to write your code is this. Instead of defining something as a function that returns a future, which you can accidentally lose or uh, uh, and create a resource leaf, define it as a suspending function. And suspending functions are, uh, are designed to be sequential by default, no concurrency. But what if you need concurrency? What if you have use case you have to do two things concurrently? For that, we have the following pattern. The pattern of this, uh, we use a special uh, scope that's called Carlton scope that delimits uh, the scope of things we're doing concurrently. And this approach is called the structure of concurrency. So instead, it's just running uh, background tests in global context where you can accidentally leave them and uh, leave them out you explicitly delimit the scope of the things you will be doing concurrently. And inside of this scope, you use a sync as we did before, but you use it just in time, just in those places where you want concurrency. So you're explicit about concurrency. You're a reader of your code. You mean this, oh, I'm, I'm starting asynchronous with all this image, meaning concurrently with all the, in this case, it means concurrently with the rest of the code. And I'm starting the second image concurrently with the rest of the code. And then I wait for the first one, I wait for the second one and uh, uh, to combine the results. So Kotlin approach to async is different in this way. In Kotlin, if I use, if I write idiomatic code with suspended functions, uh, an invocation like request token is a valid expression, produces a token. And the async request token is also a valid expression and produces a future. But you see, defaults are different. Now, sequential behavior is default. Like when we write a short code, we get sequential behavior and we have to opt in into concurrency. So that's, that's Kotlin's approach. And the other important feature of Kotlin's approach that makes it uh, distinct from async await and uh, approaches in other ecosystems is the structured concurrency. So let's take a little bit closer look at it because that's, that's a very important feature. Uh, so because of this cardinal scope, when we work with multiple concurrent operations, like here in this code, if one of them crashes, anyone actually, then it, because it's started in this cardinal scope, it immediately cancels the whole scope. And Canceling the scope, it also cancels all the other operations inside. And by canceling them, we we'll make sure that nothing leaks. So this current scope block does not complete until all its children are canceled. So when this whole thing about function is over, we were 100 percent sure we have not left any resources behind, and we can safely wait for a second, say we try if it failed, knowing that the previous invocation is clean, did not leave any garbage behind. So that means that Kotlin suspending functions, they may be internal concurrent, they may do concurrent things, but they never leave this fact outside. They never have leftovers. Uh, so that basically the talking point here is concurrency needs to be structured. It should not be just, just random, let's start concurrent things and hope it all goes well. All in all, you know, I, I've talked about concurrency here, but I've never mentioned parallelism. And parallelism is actually, uh, you know, doing things in parallel, like doing lots of computation or uh, like doing many things at once. And in Kotlin currency, parallelism optional. Kotlin currencies are all about concurrency, being able to decompose your problem into concurrent things. Parallelism is Kotlin is optional. It's actually controlled by this context parameter, I can say what thread pool I want to execute, I want. I can use single threaded pool, multi-threaded pool. That's an optional aspect to your code. Like when you read the business logic, you shouldn't care whether it has parallelism or not. It's just optimization you add later on, but it's not the business logic. So it's it's an optional aspect of your code. And that's how Kotlin coroutines are designed to operate. The other important thing is that coroutines are way more than about asynchrony. 
Uh, and that's one of the reasons the modifier is called suspend, not the sync. Because the same compiler feature that drives uh, you know, asynchronous programming, it actually can be used to fully synchronous purpose. For example, in Kotlin, uh, you can define an infinite Fibonacci sequence by writing this very readable code. You just write imperative code that defines uh, how Fibonacci sequence is built, and it's all. Uh, and then you can ask, for example, first 10 elements out of it, print to a list, and get result. And the building blocks here are very similar to what we've seen for synchronous programming. Uh, it's a special caroutine builder that defines a block of code that's going to be caroutine, a special suspending function that's, that's available inside, but it's all completely synchronous. Uh, you know, there's no asynchrony here. Like the code that uses Fibonacci sequence drives when the code inside Fibonacci sequence definition writes. There's no, no asynchrony at all. And there's one big reason uh, not, uh, uh, so do not conflate Kotlin Caroutines 100% with asynchronous programming. It's, it's just a feature that lets you suspend the execution of, of a piece of code and uh, continue from the point where you left. So that leads us to the concluding remark that in Kotlin, core language and keep small, unlike some other languages which add lots of keyword, like a single way to generate yield, Kotlin just adds one modifier that's called suspend uh, to the language, and it's now standard in Kotlin 1.3, the standard part of the language. Uh, it adds small core primitive to the Kotlin standard library that allow you building on top of that. And the, of course, compiler is a big feature in compiler. You remember that this suspend function is converted to functions with callback, and that's heavy lifting the compiler does for you. But the rest of it, and lots of the stuff we're actually seeing uh, in this presentation, are an external library. It's actually an external that we maintain. It's called Kotlin Scarutins. It's open source. And the beauty of it is that you can take a look at the source, you can contribute, you can uh, help develop, or you can develop your own that suits your needs you know, with the support uh, that uh, language uh, gives you. Uh, so it's always now. Uh, you can learn more uh, on our website uh, that has a good learning section about uh, tutorials for curtains. And now I'll uh, switch to your questions that you've asked online, answer some of them that are related to curtains, and then I will turn to Andrew so he answers uh, the question uh, more general character about Kotlin and everything. So let me open, let me open with the questions we have. Please wait a second. Here we go. Uh, so, so how Kotlin? So that's that's interesting. So that first question I see on my screen. So how Kotlin curtains tackle reactive fix use cases? I mean, it's it's funny questions. All people ask it. Uh, first of all, reactive fix is a library, and Kotlin curtains is a language feature. So Kotlin curtains do not tackle reactive use cases at all. It's Reactive fix is library, you tell, tackle those use cases by writing a library. Kotlin Curtains is this language feature that enables you writing code in readable and structured way without callbacks. And so you can write reactive fix like library that would tackle those use cases based on Kotlin Curtains, you know, but the Kotlin itself is just a language mechanism, like being able to sum to numbers or, you know, do things like that. So it doesn't, it's like comparing apples and oranges here. Uh, so let me pick some other, I've seen some other interested questions. Are coroutines stack safe? Uh, I don't know what stack safe means, uh, sorry, so I, can, I cannot, I mean, I can't really answer the question. It was fun, but uh, I have no idea. If you clarify by the end that I, I will answer it. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting question. Everyone is interested about Project Loom, JVM Fibers, and Cotton Coroutines, and how they will coexist. So. Kotlin Caroutines and Project Loom that's, that's being worked on by, by GVM team, they exist in different abstraction levels. So Kotlin Caroutines is a feature of Kotlin as a language. It does not depend on any runtime support. Basically, as you see in Kotlin Caroutines, it's a compiler feature that transforms your nicely written code into this ugly code with callback behind the scenes, so you don't have to write this ugly code. Uh, and so that way you can take your uh, say a synchronous networking library, say Netty, for example, and you can uh, adapt it to Kotlin to then write really nice looking code on top of it. 
But Project Bloom takes a different approach. The top pension tries to solve similar problem, but it solves it on a runtime level. So the idea of Project Bloom to introduce fibers into uh, GVM runtime, uh, that these lightweight threads that uh, you know can share uh, one heavyweight thread. Uh, the, and that's, that's the key difference between approach. So it, with Cosmos, every, th every feature is part of the library. You can replace, you can tweak it, adjust. And uh, with Kotlin Coutines, the nice thing about Kotlin Coutines is actually delimits your asynchronous code from your synchronous code. So when I read, so I'm working with a big project, and if I'm using Kotlin Coutines as a Kotlin language feature, uh, then, uh, for example, I'm reading somebody else's code, and I see uh, the code invokes a function called getFoo. I don't know what GitHub does. Does it go to cache or does it go to network? With Kotlin coroutines, all I have to do is to look whether it has a suspend modifier. And if it has a suspend modifier, all the way I know it. A long operation that uh, you know probably goes to network or something doesn't have suspend modifier. Or the quick operation that you know works on the cache. And that's another feature, like a feature of a type system that helps me distinguish one type of code from the other. Uh, Project Loom is, works on different versions on the runtime, uh, so it doesn't have this. Uh, doesn't give me these nice language features. But how can they coexist? Uh, of course, when the project looms comes out and actually gets delivered as a part of GVM, we can use the runtime support the Kotlin project to improve some of the uh, performance, maybe, maybe features of Kotlin. We'll see you know, how it goes, but of course, we can use this runtime support uh, to make some improvements to Kotlin coroutines. Uh, so what else I can answer? Uh, uh, does Kotlin Native fully support coroutines? Uh, so the current uh, Kotlin Native does support food in the sense that uh, in, there are basically two questions here. First of all, Kotlin Native has support for suspend keyword. It does all the same transformation and uh, the same actually true for Kotlin JavaScript. So uh, suspend keyword and all these compiler heavy lifting inside compiler fully work in any Kotlin backend. The libraries uh, for this, like Kotlin X coroutines library, also supported on both JavaScript and Kotlin native. The only limitation that we currently have is that using Kotlin coroutines with Kotlin native, you can only run your code in a single thread, uh, which is limitation we're working on to lift. Uh, but I mean, I want to stress here that coroutines are more about concurrency than parallelism, and uh, lots of useful applications uh, don't actually need multiple threads. You know, you can do lots of things in a single thread, in a UI thread, if you if you use a synchrony, if you instead of blocking UI thread, you use coroutines to just suspend it and uh, without blocking. Uh, so what else? Uh, uh, is it correct to compare coroutines with Azure Java? I answer that it's not correct. They're completely different things. Just the library coroutines is a language feature. No, it's not correct. Uh, is there a reason why you guys didn't went with the wait keyword used in other languages for calling suspended functions? And I mean, I hope I've answered this uh, question during the presentation. There is a reason because a wait keyword is bad, you know. Uh, however, there is a trick. We could have made a slightly different decision. We could have said, okay, suspended functions are going to be sequential by default, so we want to allow to call them uh, just right away. You have to add an evade modifier instead. Just you have, and this finally that this approach Swift is inclined to take right now. They're they're also integrating a kind of a synchronous, and their their current thinking is that will require just a wait. And we thought about that: should we require something before suspending code, like a wait? Uh, and uh, there was a bit of debate. Uh, first of all, I'll be frank: we're a tooling company, so we, we I mean, why require you to write a wait if, if the tool can help you with? If just ID can show you where you system where require you actually to write it. That's the first question. That was the first argument against a weight. The second argument against the weight was uh, it really com like it really complicates uh, the logic. Like you want your code to express uh, the weight or not a weight is a secondary concern. You want business logic to be clearly visible. And that becomes especially complicated when you have loops, you know, higher order functions dropping away everywhere it just just be, you, it's called because a mass of those away application just s stops looking uh nice and clean and this uh, but if, but actually there's the third reason the third reason we just had a precedent so i mean the president the is languages like go that basically where everything can suspend like because of the you know support of uh likely threads either go runtime uh, you can suspend execution of any function and you don't slap away everywhere 
and people somehow don't get lost. Uh, there is another interesting question, that probably the last interesting question I, I'll, I'll be able to answer until I turn to Andrew, and maybe we have time at the end to answer more. Uh, so, is there any reason uh, to use globalscope.launch outside of demo snippets? So, let me clarify. So, in this demo snippets, yeah, you saw that we're running coroutines in the global scope. It's kind of uh, dangerous because it's like, you know, uh, it means like if it hangs, then it sees the occupies resources. But it's actually precisely what you should do if you need, if you want to run a process. The whole scope of it is limited by the lifetime of your GDM. So, for example, say I'm writing uh, a backend server and I have some uh, process that manages some cache. It has to clean cache periodically, do some background keep up stuff. And its lifetime, it shall operate for the whole duration of my application. That's where I use global scope. Global scope literally means the scope of the whole application until it dies. So, so I m should and must use it whenever I need globally running process that whose lifetime is delimited by my application. If I have more tightly limited background, like we've seen in the slides, I want in the scope of a function, I want to do some concurrent things. That's where I use structured concurrency. I write concurrent things in the scope of this function in the, this current scope block. But if I need something that works for duration of GVM, I, I just use a uh, global scope that launch. Uh, so there is also the big group of questions. Uh, car routines, threads, mapping, a lot of confusion in chat. Uh, there's lots of questions how routine thread mapping works, one-to-one. There's no like Carotines thread mapping. So Carotines are just piece of code that can suspend and resume. And where they resume is controlled by the dispatcher. And we provide different kinds of dispatcher. There is dispatchers.main that confines Carotine Executor in uh, the, your main UI thread. So whenever Carotin resumes, it gets dispatched on this main UI thread of application. You can create your own dispatchers. You can create single-threaded dispatchers that would always resume Carotin on single thread. You can create multiple threaded dispatchers where Carotin gets resumed on some thread in the thread pool, which is kind of close uh, uh, to the way you submit tasks to a thread pool in classic multi-threaded programming. Uh, so it's library, so it's all, all the threading in Carotin is controlled by the libraries. And the great thing about it, it's not something that hard coded, it's not something that somewhere deep inside the bottles. It's something you can easily write yourself. It's something you can easily take a look at the source of on Christian. And if you think some you have a better better fitness solution for application, you can write it. Uh, you know, it's not something we give you and you cannot change. Uh, uh, so and of course, uh, like uh, if you have, so for example, you can do end-to-end -end, uh, dispatch in there. So you can have a pool of 10 threads and dispatch uh, several thousand proteins or a million proteins on this small pool of threads. You know, and that way every time they suspend, they stop occupying the thread, they just wait there for something to happen. And when they resume, they just stand in queue and take next available thread. That's your classic, basically, green threads approach. That's what, just one of the possibilities you can implement with Carotines. Carotines just very flexible mechanism that lets you uh, uh, implement different strategies uh, of the actual execution. Uh, so, what else? Uh, let's, uh, let me then hand over to Andrew uh, and answer other All questions right. you have. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll be taking all the questions that are not coroutines related and are not very specific. Uh, the specific ones will be answered right there uh, on Twitter or in the channel. So my first question here is uh, why there is no C++ intraop in Kotlin native, or at least uh, this is what I inferred from uh, from the question in the uh, YouTube stream. So, uh, Kotlin Native has interop with C and Objective C, and it interops uh, with Swift through Objective C. Interop 
is a whole different story because C++ is a, an interesting language that doesn't have an ABI. Uh, so introp there is a huge challenge and I do not anticipate having any introp with C++ in any foreseeable future. Although if someone comes up with a brilliant idea of how to do it, it's not completely impossible. I hope this answers uh, uh, this question. And also you can uh, oftentimes interop with C++ through C interop, which is kind of a lingua franca of uh, native world. Next question is about WebAssembly. Uh, it reads, uh, WebAssembly CodeGen supports, uh, is supported in Kotlin native and uh, memory management compatibility between Kotlin native and uh, WebAssembly runtimes. Is there uh, so possibilities of convergence with Kotlin JS uh, in the future? So this is actually a pretty complicated story because WebAssembly is a moving target at the moment. Mm, so it's, uh, it's very like early origin, although I'm not sure that WebAssembly developers will agree with this, but at least the topic of having something other than a JavaScript for the browser started with ASM.js, and this is an unmanaged runtime, basically. Uh, it has uh, linear memory with no object runtime built in, and this is what WebAssembly is today, so we can run Kotlin Native on it because Kotlin Native manages its own memory. But then there is the next chapter of this story, a WebAssembly coming up with uh, very needed uh, GC support and uh, JavaScript interop support. And this brings a, an object runtime into the WebAssembly picture. So it's, and it's a completely different story. So Kotlin Native doesn't fit there uh, so easily anymore. So if you're using the WebAssembly GC uh, for interop with JavaScript, if you want to use the browser APIs and so on and so forth, then uh, Kotlin Native doesn't fit in there, and it's much closer to what we have in Kotlin JS, simply, well, not simply, but replace the um, generation of JavaScript uh, by generation of WebAssembly, and tweak some things in the interop, and there you are. Uh, as uh, for Kotlin Native, it's a completely different story, right? You take uh, your raw memory with no memory management, and you run there. So. At worst, there will be two Kotlins for WebAssembly, but I don't think uh, this is going to happen. Most likely, we'll converge in the Kotlin JS like WebAssembly backend, which will either coexist with um, Kotlin JS or, if WebAssembly is popular enough one day, will replace Kotlin JS. Uh, and it will manage, uh, well, use the memory management mechanisms of WebAssembly. We're not there yet. Uh, there is a zero work. Uh, finished on WebAssembly GC, no browser support the GC today, so it's a very distant future, and uh, we are watching this process closely. We want to be uh, present in the WebAssembly world, uh, so we'll keep uh, in touch with the WebAssembly team and see what comes out of this. Uh, more questions about WebAssembly. Yeah, just wishes that uh, Kotlin becomes uh, big player in that space. Yes, we want that. Uh, the premise would be for WebAssembly to actually release uh, something uh, not, not experimental. We're waiting for that. Uh, and I think that's it for WebAssembly. Another question on Kotlin Native. As of 1.3, the only code coverage support from Kotlin is for JVM. LLVM supports different ways of code coverage, but they require compiler support, so can we expect uh, code coverage support in uh, 1.3 updates for JavaScript or native. Uh, there, this isn't on the roadmap at the moment. I'm not sure uh, really if anyone looked at, into this too closely, but if you really need uh, code coverage tools for your business use case, please come to us, uh, for example, on public Slack or uh, to the issue tracker and document your use case so that we know what kind of people need this and uh, we'll be able to prioritize this somehow. Thank you. Uh, next question is about Android. If I wrote an Android JVM library using Kotlin 1.2 and uh, uh, an application using it upgrades to 1.3, could I run into some compatibility issues, excluding experimental features? So our policy is that this shouldn't happen. Uh, binary code shouldn't break between updates. 
And uh, so if you run into any incompatibilities of this sort, it's a bug. So please report it. And we, I don't think we have any such bugs reported so far. Um, so my answer is modulo, very embarrassing bugs, no. Uh, there shouldn't be any incompatibilities there. Uh, a follow up to this question, any things I should know about when writing libraries that could break compatibility? So um, compatibility is a big thing uh, for Kotlin in many respects. Uh, one important thing is how from the compiler side we uh, try to maintain the ABI as stable as possible. When we add things, uh, we don't break existing things. When we change things, we make sure that all the ABIs work. Uh, so there, in terms of uh, having the same source code and compiling it again and getting ABI compatible binaries, there is nothing you need to do. In terms of writing uh, your library sources so that when you evolve them, uh, the ABI is stable. Uh, there is some work that's required on your part. There is uh, some documentation on this on the Kotlin website. But the gist is that you should care about uh, making things public explicitly so that you can keep track of what is actually your API and what isn't. Uh, A, B, you shouldn't use any type inference uh, for return types of public declarations. And this is not so much uh, not so relevant actually for application developers because this only affects the ABI. When you have your return type inferred from a body, uh, you can accidentally have, it, have a more precise type there. Like uh, it used to be uh, type A and then you change something in the implementation of this method or some other method and the type of inference figures out that now it's type B that's subtype of A. From a source standpoint, there is no problem. From the binary standpoint, there is a huge problem. The JVM sees a different signature and the library won't link at runtime. So uh, to prevent this, just spell out all the public return types explicitly. Uh, this is what, what you need to do to uh, maintain your uh, binary compatibility. Uh, speaking of source compatibility, we also expect uh, you to sensibly name your methods in terms of uh, having overloads do roughly the same thing. Because uh, when some type inference gets smarter, it may select a more specific overload, and if it does this completely different thing, the logic in your program may break. Um, so this is uh, what you can do for your users. I mean, not only from the Kotlin standpoint, but, but from the sensibility standpoint, uh, your names should be descriptive enough and overloads should do uh, roughly the same thing. Uh, next question is, not directly about Kotlin, but is there a release date for the parcelized annotation? I believe the parcelized um, code is now maintained by uh, somebody outside the Kotlin team, so I can't tell you much about the release date. Uh, it's on the uh, Android side now, so uh, sorry, can't say anything about this. Uh, next question. Uh, oh, it has a confession. I love inline classes would also uh, love to use them in APIs. What is the roadmap to drop the experimental state? Well, before dropping the experimental state, we need to stabilize the current design. Uh, inline classes are pretty tricky. There is a lot to improve about this design, so I can't tell you any, anything about the dates. We are now looking at the use cases. We've only started using inline classes uh, as uh, a mechanism for uh, unsigned types, uh, we're using using them a little here and there uh, in Kotlin APIs, Kotlin libraries are uh, trying to use them in, in many places. Uh, users outside JetBrains are using them in reporting feedback, so it's a bit early to say anything about when they go stable. This is a big experiment. So another question about inline classes is, can or should inline classes be used in production code? Uh, it also refers to coroutines that were experimental for a long time, but uh, was a production quality um, and upgrade paths were supplied. So here is uh, roughly, roughly the same story. Uh, you can use inline classes in your production code. When we change something in the design, we'll try to make your updates as comfortable as possible. No gu guarantees there, but I expect that things will only require recompilation. So don't use them in public APIs what the client depends on because the APIs will change. I mean, the ABIs, the binary interfaces will change. 
uh, inside your production code base when only you, uh, you depend on it yourself, you can use this feature, uh, the design will be tweaked. And uh, yeah, you'll have to migrate, but uh, in the same way as Coroutines did. Next question, what's on the roadmap for improving compiler speed, both JVM and, 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 and sorry, native targets? Compiler speed uh, has been a huge crusade on our part, so the Kotlin compiler can be sped up, uh, and we've been working on this quite a bit, like every release we ship, a significant uh, speed improvements. We keep working on this uh, in many directions. First of all, we are working on a new compiler architecture that should speed things up a lot, but it's pretty hard to tell when this gets ready. Uh, before that, uh, we are improving our incremental compilation, we are optimizing uh, our Gradle infrastructure, which is relevant for Android, we are optimizing the compiler infrastructure in general, uh, which is re relevant, relevant for everybody. Kotlin Native is working on specific optimizations to speed up the compilation because there is, uh, on top of uh, uh, things common for all Kotlin backends, there is something specific to uh, the workload you put on LLVM. LLVM can require a lot of time to do optimization, so we, we're trying to feed as little uh, code into it as possible. So yeah, we are doing a lot of work there. Uh, there will be updates, hopefully pretty soon. Uh, what's the current status and future goal for performance on Kotlin Native? Uh, I wonder what to make of it. Uh, since I've told you about the compiler performance, I'll interpret this question in the sense of the generated code. So far, we are doing some basic optimizations in Kotlin Native, and there is a lot more to optimize in the generated code. Uh, we are starting to look into this right now. Uh, some things will be reused across different compiler backends. Uh, some things will be specific for Kotlin Native, but overall, the generated code will speed up quite a bit over the next couple of months. Okay, uh, next one. Any info you could share about KPT incremental annotation processing for Gradle? This is a bit too specific. Uh, oh, no, it's too unspecific. Uh, all I can say, we're working on it. We understand it's very important. It's also very tricky. Um, annotation processing for Kotlin is a miracle. I want everybody to understand this. Uh, the fact that Kotlin can support annotation processors written for another language is a miracle. So if we make this work incrementally, it's a double miracle, and we're working on it. Uh, next one is uh, possibilities uh, of support to UFCS. Okay, yeah, so uniform function ca call syntax. This is something from the D programming language and NIM programming language, pretty exotic. Uh, basically, there are languages that um, have different approach to, let's say, extension functions that what, than what we have. In Kotlin, you have to specifically declare a function as an extension uh, to be able to call it with a dot after a receiver. Uh, D and NIM enable uh, this kind of call on any function that takes any argument. You can, you can simply turn it first, your first argument into a receiver. I don't think we're getting this anytime soon. There hasn't been much demand, and this will complicate things quite a bit. So probably not, but if you have a very strong use case, uh, let us know. Uh, next thing, I understand it's too early, but when and where will be the next Kotlin Conf? Uh, the honest answer is we don't know yet. We are examining the options, but hopefully somewhere on planet Earth. Uh, next one, will JetBrains create an ID uh, for Kotlin, uh, specific to Kotlin? Uh, it would make quite a nice pair. All right, so uh, currently, this is, this is like, this is a product question, right? So if we find that uh, such an ID serves our users, that like many people will benefit from uh, such an ID, uh, we'll definitely work on it. So far, it seems that integrating Kotlin support into uh, other IDs, like uh, IntelliJ IDEA, uh, makes a little more sense, so we're working on this. Okay, uh, next one. Colin's biggest market is Android. Have you thought about the future of Colin if Dart Flutter really takes over the mobile web market and Google gets rid of the JVM? Well, uh, of course, if 
this happens, then there is no more Android, and the world will, will be very difficult, uh, very different. Uh, so I can't really say what happens then. But I don't think that it's so easy to drop the core component of your entire platform and a platform with billions of devices, you know? So, well, yeah, I don't believe in this use case, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next thing, Kotlin multi-platform course that covers JVM Android and native iOS, just like the Kotlin for Java course on Coursera would be great. Yeah, it would. Uh, and uh, uh, the Android courses are available in different pl different platforms, and will there probably will be a one on Coursera as well. Uh, and there is another question: when we can expect the Core Genius course in Coursera? This should have been addressed, Roman, I think, but um, hopefully at some point in the future. Okay, uh, next one. Any ideas for future libraries coming on multi-platform? There are many ideas, like lots of ideas. Uh, some of the library APIs that we have are experimental at the moment, so we'll be stabilizing them. Uh, we are working on many things in the realm of net networking. So KDOR, the connected application framework that we have, has some components uh, that will be fleshed out over time, like WebSockets, for example, and a generic asynchronous I.O., and so on and so forth. Uh, we definitely want basic components like file I.O. supported uh, multi-platform, or as multi-platform as this is possible. Uh, at some point, uh, we need support for things like dates and so on and so forth database support at some point, and many, many more things. There are a lot more ideas than a single team can handle. So as much as uh, anyone can help uh, working in your own libraries will be very, very appreciated. Uh, last question on my list, why would Kotlin native not compete with Go? Why wouldn't it really? It will. I mean, this is, is it's definitely addressing similar problems. So I, I expect Kotlin native to be a really nice competitor to go and we'll see how this unrolls. And uh, I mean, if you if you try to think of uh, what are pros and cons for these two languages in the realm of uh, microservices, there are many things to compare here. For example, Kotlin has a much more powerful abstraction mechanisms. Uh, and as soon as our libraries catch up, uh, there will be a very interesting competition. Go, uh, is, uh, in its turn, uh, is working on improvements to the language, like they are looking to add in generics. I understand how hard that is, so I'm not giving any uh, predictions there. But yeah, it, it will be an interesting game. OK, next one. Will Kotlin have type classes and other functional concepts on language level? Well, uh, I would say I want type classes or some equivalent mechanism uh, in Kotlin one day. Uh, it's very hard to tell when this will be ready because uh, we can't add everything at once. But yes, yeah, something like type classes uh, would be very, very nice to have in Kotlin. Um, other functional concepts, not sure what you're talking about. Some are too crazy for any mainstream programming. Some are very useful. Uh, we'll be looking into use cases and adding things as they are needed. And I think this concludes my list. So thank you all very much for your attention today. It was great talking to you and answering questions. And uh, have a nice Kotlin. Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>